Encounter 2024. How we doing this morning? We are hopped up on Mountain Dew and the Holy Spirit. I can hear it. Hey, uh, who, who was the one that was here, stayed up till, what was it, six in the morning? Where are you at? Seven. My goodness. If you don't crash today, my friend, you are my hero. Come on. That's incredible. Okay, okay, okay. So, 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 this morning... Man, I'm so excited because we've got a, a bunch that we're going to go through. And really, my favorite part of what we do at these encounter conferences, uh, the, the worship is amazing, speaking is, eh, it's all right. But small groups, that is where it's at, right? Like, how many of y'all enjoyed your small group last night? Good combo? Yeah. So I'm telling you, these times, the small group moments really capitalize on them. These are some of my favorite moments. I actually didn't come to faith till 26, and it was in the context of a small group that my life changed. And so, again, if you're here, you're kind of, like I use the term, kicking the tires of Christianity. You're checking the whole Christian thing out, the Jesus thing out. This is your opportunity. You're in a great spot to be able to ask questions. Ask some hard stuff. I guarantee you, your leaders, uh, your, your peers, they're gonna love to be able to walk you through, help you understand who Jesus is and what he's all about. Uh, one other side note before we dive into the text today, uh, my good friend Jeff from First Priorities. Uh, Jeff, can you raise your hand over here? Everybody say, hi, Jeff. <laughs> Jeff is here, and uh, Jeff leads what's called First Priorities. And so if you're here today, you are pumped, you're excited, and you want to make a difference in your school, Jeff is the guy that you want to talk to, okay? So Jeff, he helps students lead Bible studies and Jeff, how many, how many uh, students came to faith just this last year nationwide at First Priority? 5,000. Come on, put your hands together for what God's doing. So I would just encourage you, if you want to make a difference in your school, go see Jeff, go see Miles, go see PYT, all right? Go see them, and I guarantee you they're going to get you on the right track. Well, our text today comes out of Luke chapter number 5. And uh, for any preacher, like, this is like preaching with candy, okay? Every preacher loves this passage. But we're going to take a look today at the passage out of Luke chapter 15, excuse me, not 5, Luke chapter 15, and it's a story of three different things. There's a story of a coin, a sheep, and a son, and we're going to take a look at that this morning. So what I want you to do before we get there is I want you to turn to your neighbor, I want you to look him right in the eye and say, you look good this morning. Say it with some audacity now. I know you're lying. Y'all were up till like six in the morning. Say, you look good this morning. All right, let's dive in here. Luke chapter 15, starting in verse number one. Y'all love Jesus? Y'all love Jesus? Okay. So here's Jesus, and he's here in Galilee. And all of a sudden, He's hanging out with some people. Luke chapter 15, verse 1. Now the tax collectors and the sinners were all drawing near to Jesus. Man, that's a good thing, right? People that are far from God, here they are. They're drawing near to Jesus. And it said, the Pharisees and the scribes, they grumbled, saying, this man, he receives sinners and he eats with them. Like, that's a bad thing. But yet, in this day and age, that was a bad thing. And then Jesus goes on and he tells Three different stories. The first story he tells is the story of the lost sheep. The second story he tells is the story of the lost coin. And then the one that we're going to look at today is the story of what many call the lost son. We're going to jump down to verse number 11. And he said, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had, and he took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of the country, who had sent him into the field to feed the pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything." Talk about a low moment, right? Like you're, you're longing to eat just what the pigs are eating. And oh, by the way, that's, it's even worse because of the, the context of this. He was a Jewish man who would have seen pigs as just the most unclean thing that you could possibly be around. And here he is in the middle of this moment. He, he finds himself in just the absolute bottom, rock bottom. Verse 17. But when he came 
to himself. He said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here for hunger? I will arise and I will go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and he came to his father and while he was still a long way off. How many know that that's the heart of God? That while we're still a long way off, it says that the father saw him, he felt compassion and he ran and he embraced him. He kissed him and he said to his son, or excuse me, and the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring the best robe and put it on him and put the ring on his hand and the shoes on his feet. See, these, these two things, this would have symbolized authority. This would have symbolized sonship. This would have symbolized not only are you back, but you're in the family. He said, put this on him. And then what I want you to do is I want you to bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate for this son of mine which was dead is alive again. He is lost and now is found. And they begin to celebrate. Now his older brother was in the field and he came and he drew near to the house and he heard the music and dancing. And he called to one of the servants and asked, what are these things? What, what did these mean? And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has received him back safe." And sound. But he was angry and he refused to go in. His father came out and he entreated him. But he answered him, Father, look, these many years I have served you. And I've never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. And when this son of yours who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him? And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It is fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this brother of yours was dead, is now alive. He was lost and is found. Would you pray with me? Father, I ask right now, once again, that you, Holy Spirit, would speak. I pray over these words. You, you tell us in your word that when we preach, when we share your word, that it does not come back void. Father, I give you praise for the three that put their faith and trust in you last night, entering from death to life, coming into the family of God. I pray for those today, Holy Spirit, that you need to speak to. I pray that you would draw them to yourself, allow them to see you, Father, for who you are. I pray for some others here, Father, that are, that are believers, that are followers, and this story speaks to us as well. I pray that you would show us what you want us to see. Get me out of the way, and Holy Spirit, I pray that you would speak. Amen. I... Um, I despise traveling. Anybody else out there? Where, where are my Granberry people at? I, I despise traveling. Don't get me wrong. I like arriving. I like arriving. I, but I hate traveling. And, and I think it's probably a product of my age. Like the older that I'm getting, like the more that I hate traveling. And it used to not be that way. Like I remember in my 20s, I'd be like, all right, this is going to be amazing. We're going to go and hit the road. And I'd put together my mixtape. Y'all don't know nothing about that. You put together your mixtape, get my song selection on, and I'll be out there and I'll be cruising, right? Like if it's a sunny day, like I've got my, my incredible playlist. I've got my little cartel if I'm in a happy mood, right? None of y'all know about cartel. I've got some Green Day, maybe some Third Eye Blind. I'm just showing my age right now. Nobody knows what Ben's talking about. Or if it's, a, if it's rainy and it's sad and it's a bad day, I mean, I've got my Taking Back Sunday, right? I've got Dashboard Confessional. Any of my emo people out there? Okay, yeah, I'll stand here in my shame. That's okay. No, man, each, each one of these, it was so exciting because I'd hit the road and there was adventure ahead. But nowadays, it just seems like as a dad of three, and, and it's probably because my dreams have been crushed because of a minivan, traveling just isn't the same. Like I get out on the road with all these hopes and expectations, and what I find is that these dreams come crumbling down, and instead of hopes and in dreams, what I find is juice boxes, crumble crackers, and a hint of pee somewhere in the car, right? Like that's my reality to my travel nowadays. And so I find that, man, I just don't like traveling anymore. And there's like this small part of me that it kind of dies on the inside, right? Like this, this sense of adventure. And I find that I'm becoming more and more of a homebody. Like, I just, I just love to be home. Like, my house isn't exquisite, it's not expansive, it's not, you know, this mansion, but it's, it's mine. You know what I mean? Like, for me, I just love to be home. Anybody out there, you just love to curl up, you like to watch a little Netflix, you got the fire on, right, when it's nice and cold out, 
Come on. It's like I get my coffee and I'm just, I'm enjoying my time. There's nothing like home. Now, I find that as I get older, I just absolutely love it. It's safe, it's secure, it's sanctuary. And I think nothing says home to me like my toilet. No, I'm just going to let that sit. Nothing says home. I know you're judging me right now. I see your eyes. Nothing says home to me like the toilet. And I'll tell you why. You ladies, y'all are the worst about this. How many of y'all will hold it for like two hours just to make it home? Like, no, 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 I'm not going to use the one out of the, out of the gas station. Even if it's Bucky's, y'all, y'all still holding it. Nothing says home like my toilet. I'll come home, and this is, I'm telling you, this is married life right here. Kids are acting a fool. I just close that door, and I got my sanctuary all to myself. Nothing says home like my toilet. I'm like, man, this is amazing. This is great, unless, again, you've got kids. In that case, I would encourage you to have seat covers at home as well. But there is nothing like home. Home's where you belong. Home is where you can let your hair down. Home is where in the middle of the day you can put on sweatpants, right? That's home. It's comfortable. It's relaxing. And I was thinking about this when it comes to this idea of home is that for us, like our physical bodies, like we need a place that's ours. It doesn't have to be incredible, but it has to be ours. Our physical bodies long for a place called home. How many of you know that our spiritual souls, our souls long for a place called home as well? In fact, for, for many of us, that's our story, is that for a long period in our life, we were longing in our soul for a place called home, a place where we would find rest and relaxation, where we would find satisfaction in our soul. Today, we're seeing a story of how Jesus highlights this for you and for me, this idea of home, sweet home. Home, sweet home. What does it look like for your soul to be home? Well, Jesus, he he sets up this story because Pharisees come to him. These were people that they had heard what Jesus was doing and they didn't like it. So they said, we we are going to murder this guy. We're going to figure out a way to stop what he's saying. And so they see that sinners and tax collectors, people that were on the outside, people that were the, were the ones that were being hurt and the ones doing the hurting were coming to Jesus because Jesus was welcoming them, in, welcoming them in. And they said, we've got to put a stop to this. And so Jesus, in response, he tells a story. And it's a story that many of us that have been in the church have heard for a long time. But I believe that we've only heard the first part of the story and want to highlight the full story today. You see, Jesus, when he tells this story, he contrasts this story between two sons. Often we hear the story of the one son, the younger brother. But Jesus, as he's telling this to the Pharisees, he's actually highlighting the story of two brothers, of two sons. Take a look at verse number 12 with me, if you would. Look what Jesus says here, right at the beginning of the story. He says, and the younger of them came to his father And he said, give me the share of property that is coming to me. Now that that statement in and of itself is incredibly bold. Because what the younger son is essentially saying is that, uh, Father, the only way that I can get any of your stuff is once you die. And so when he comes to the father and he says, give me my share, he's essentially saying, I wish you were dead. Could you imagine saying something like that? The younger son, so brazen in his attitude toward his father, comes and says, I wish you were dead. Now give me what is mine. And in this culture with two sons, the younger son would have been entitled to one-third of the property or the estate. The older son would have been entitled to two-thirds of that property. And so we know that this family was wealthy. We know this because of the property that they had, the cattle that they had, the servants and livestock. This was a wealthy family. This is one that... We know that there was an insignia ring, which meant power and status. This would have been a family who would have been a leader in the community. So not only is this son saying, Dad, I wish you were dead on a personal level, he's also saying that within the context of the community, you had no value. Even more than that, the word here that is used for, the Greek word that is used for land is bios, where we get biology or life. Their very identity of these Jews was tied to the land. 
And what's shocking is what comes next. Because the audience would have heard Jesus say, this younger son comes to the father. Hey, father, I want my share of the estate. They would have known immediately that he's basically saying, I wish you were dead. And they would have expected the patriarch of the family to take off a sandal and beat the son out of the house. That was the expectation. But instead, look what Jesus says. And he divided his property between them. If the land is the life, it's the identity, what the father is literally doing is tearing himself in two. He's splitting himself for his son. You see, the loss of land was the loss of identity. It was the loss of who he was. It was loss of standing in the community, all for this selfish son. And the shocking part is, is that the father does it. What? what? Why would you do such a thing? And so here he goes. He, he tears himself in two. Let's continue on with the story. Verse 13. Not many days later, it says that this young son, he gathered all that he had, gathered into a far country, and there he squandered all that he had. He squanders everything on this wild living Right, he's there with prostitutes and he's blowing his money, gambling, he's blowing his money out with all the best that the world can offer. We don't know how long it was, but we know that at some point he hits rock bottom. He squanders it all. And he comes to this point where he's there in a pig trough and it says that he comes to himself. There's like this light bulb moment where he comes to himself as he's probably there in the pigsty with the most unclean thing that a Jewish boy could possibly be around. And all of a sudden he has this epiphany, he goes... And it was better off in my dad's house. It was better off when I was a son. I know I got freedom and I feel like, you know, I can do whatever I want, but man, I've really made a mess when I've done it my way. You know, this is the story of a lot of us, that we found ourselves at rock bottom. I can guarantee you, you can talk to a lot of the counselors around here. I, you come back on Sunday, there's plenty of people in our church that can tell you, like, that's their story. They hit rock bottom and, and, and came to themselves and asked the question, why, why am I doing this? And the son, he, he does the same thing. And it says he, he comes to himself. And I want you to see the speech that he gives. It says, I know what I'll do. I'm gonna give this great speech. Dad's gonna love it. This is exactly what I'm gonna say, right? Verse 19, check it out. He says, I'll arise, excuse me, verse 18. I'll arise and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you I'm no longer, if you've got your highlight, I want you to highlight this. He says, worthy, worthy. He, he uses this type of thinking. And this is often those that come from a religious background. This is what the natural human mindset is, as we think in terms of worth. He says, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. Now, what he's not saying is that he's not asking to be a slave, okay? He's not asking to be a slave. What he's asking to be is a hired hand, someone that would live still in the community but would come as a free man to the property and would work for his dad. What he's essentially saying is that I want to work to pay you back. I'm no longer worthy. Let me do what I can to earn my worth and come back into your good graces. I know I can't be a son. I know I don't want to be a slave, but I will be a hired hand and I will work year after year, month after month, and eventually earn my way back into your good graces. For many of us, that is our primary thought when it comes to Christianity. In fact, that's the human idea. All religions outside of Christianity have this mindset that if we do more good than we do bad, then we will earn our way into God's good graces and we will find ourselves at the end of the day, almost like a big set of scales, we've done more good than we've done bad, which means then that we get to enter into heaven. Many of you, you that's kind of the thought process that you come in here today with. That's, that's where I'm at. If I can just earn my way, God will have to let me in. And so here comes the son with this really weak speech. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. You see, the problem is, is that home is not primarily a place, but it's a relationship. Home, I'm going to say it again. Home is not primarily a place. It's a relationship. 
And he comes back and he says, I want to earn my way back into relationship. I don't know about you, but I've never earned my way into a relationship. You see, this is our thinking when it comes to heaven. This is our thinking when it comes to God. I can earn my way back home. So the son thinks, okay, here comes my apology. It's gonna be great. You can hear him practicing it as he's on his way back. He's walking back. He's got his little knapsack. He's like thinking, okay, here's what I'm gonna say. Here's how I'm gonna do it. And what's funny is this, is that the son thinks he's coming back because of his apology. But look what the father does here. Verse number 20. And he arose and he came to his father. And if you got your highlighter, I want you to highlight this. But while he was still a long way off, while he was still a long way off, the father saw him, felt compassion, and ran and embraced him. You know, I'm thinking, okay, this, this had better be good. If I'm one of the people in the crowd or the Pharisees, I'm thinking, okay, this is where Jesus is gonna lay the hammer, right? Because this son, can you imagine saying that you wish your dad dead, the public humiliation within the community, the tearing of himself and, and the humiliation that that would have taken, and then the audacity after he squandered it all to come back, I'm betting that father, he's sitting there on the porch thinking, oh, this is gonna be good. Get him, Jesus. You tell him. Tell him how he should have done it. Tell him what he should have done. Give him. Give him everything that he deserved. But look, look what happens. It said that while he was still a long way off the father, he runs. You know, this is shocking because in this day and age, the patriarch, the father figure, the leader, he didn't run. Right? The hired hands ran. Right? The kids and the youth, they ran. Right? Even the women, they ran. But the patriarch, the one that held the status, the one that was the pillar of the family, they didn't run. And so he embarrasses himself by picking up his robe and running to greet his son. All the emotion, I want you to see this because this is the heart of our father here today for those prodigals, those that are far from God, is that God, he's telling us right now, he says that I don't care what anybody else thinks. I don't care what anybody thinks that I should do. I have a grace that is far surpassing, that is exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you could ask or imagine. I will pull up my robe and I will run to you, even though what you deserve is the exact opposite. God the Father, he says, this is my heart toward you, that I long to reconcile, that if it takes me taking the first, second, third, 100th step before you take one toward me, while you are still a long way off, God the Father, he runs. And it says that this father, he comes and he embraces because of love. And what's shocking is this, is that the son, he tries to get out this pathetic speech. But look at the response of the father. I love it. Love how Jesus shares it. It says, and the son said to him, right? Here's this rehearsed speech. He goes, Father, same exact thing he thought. I've sinned against heaven and before God. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Look at the response of the father, verse 22. But the father said to his servants, he doesn't even respond to him. He just looks away. He's like, you don't get it. You don't get it. It's not about your worth. It's not about that. And he tells his servants, he goes, go get the best robe. Put it on him. Go get a ring. That's a 40. Put it on his hand. Get some shoes for his feet. My son isn't going to be walking around barefoot. Put some Put some sandals on him. Get the fatted calf and kill it and let's eat and celebrate. You know, the father is saying to the son and God the father today is saying to many of you here is that you're not a son or daughter by worth. You're a son or daughter by birth. That it is about relationship. You can't earn your way into God's family. There's no amount of good deeds that you can do in order to make Make God owe you in some way. And he just cuts the younger son off. And it, it goes incredibly, right? Here comes this great, incredible meal. And they celebrate, right? They celebrate. Verse 23 and 24, right? They get the fatted calf. Now, that doesn't mean much to you and me today, but in this culture, eating meat was a delicacy. And the greatest of all the meats, not a chicken, not a goat, not a lamb, the fatted calf, the most expensive of all the animals that this father owned. It says, we are gonna butcher it 
and we're gonna have a feast. In fact, what this is saying is that not only is this family wealthy because they have a fatted calf, but this would have been a, a party, a celebration that due to the influence of this family, the entire village would have come together. If they had killed the fatted calf, what would have happened is the whole town, I want you to imagine for a moment, you've got the ranch, you've got, you've got the, uh, the long road back home, and you've got this expansive ranch and this, this mansion out in, out in the boonies, they, they say, hey, we're gonna kill the fatted calf. All the servants go out into town to gather for this big meal, and the whole village starts coming in. Ones and twos and threes, families coming in to celebrate because when they kill the fatted calf, the father is essentially saying, everybody is gonna know that my son that was lost is now found. Everybody's gonna celebrate this great blessing, and essentially what he's saying is, this is the greatest day of my entire life. For almost every single person that would have been in this, at this meal, at this banquet, this would have been the very first time they'd ever eaten fatted calf. This is how exquisite this meal is. And so here they are, and they are preparing to celebrate. They bring the fatted calf, and they kill it. For the son was dead, is alive, he was lost, and is found. And the father is basically telling the son, he's like, hey, get on the dance floor. I'm going to put you right back where you were. You can't earn your way back. See, the problem is for you and for me is that we often, we want our independence. We want our freedom. We want the ability to hold God so that when we do good things, God is obligated to help us. God, you're obligated because I did these good things. And often we believe that satisfaction comes from the freedom from the rules of our Father. If I can just get freedom, and you may feel that here today, especially being under your, your parents and under the household, not having that freedom. We often feel that if we can just get that freedom, then we would finally find that satisfaction. And the younger son, he points to us and he tells us, hey, that's not the case. Like following and, and, and running away from the father, that's not where true satisfaction lies. And you would think, as Jesus shares the story, that this, this is the end. Like that's a great story, right? God's grace his love, it's extended to this prodigal son who, who blew it all. We see the grace of God and we all stand back and we're like, yeah, yeah, go Jesus. That's awesome. We love it. But do you remember what we first talked about? Why, why is Jesus sharing this story? Who's he talking to? He's talking to people that hate that he's with tax collectors and sinners. He's talking to them, and he says, but that's not the end of the story. You see, the story of the prodigal son actually isn't about the younger son. It's about the older son. And Jesus continues on in the story. Look at verse 25. He says here, now, here comes the meat of the story. Yeah, that first part was awesome. We get to see the heart of God. But this is what Jesus is trying to get at. Now, this older son was in the field. And he came and drew near to the house. So I want you to imagine for a moment, this is the elder son. Outside of the father, he owns everything. And in fact, he is the future patriarch. He's not out there laboring in the field. He's out there managing under the shade. And all of a sudden, he starts to hear some commotion. There starts to be some rustling. Lots of, lots of action starts to take place. He starts to see villagers from way out in the far areas. They start to, to come into the house. And he starts to look around and thinking, what is going on? You can, you can almost anticipate, like, something exciting has happened. Like, what, what has happened? Have we found something? Has, has there been a great victory? Like, what, what do we know has happened? Because the only way that this is happening is if my father wants to celebrate. And so you can imagine toward the end of the day, he, there with anticipation, begins to make his way back to the house. And we see that as he makes his way back, he asks the question of one of the boys from the village, right? This isn't one of the hired hands. This isn't one of his younger brothers. This is one of the kids who's just come in from one of the villages and he's excited that he's gonna eat for the very first time some fatted calf, right? Come on, y'all, a little filet mignon, bacon wrapped. I'm there for it, right? He's ready for it. And he shows up and he asks this boy the question. He says, what is going on? Your brother, he says, has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has received him back safe and sound. And look at the response of the older brother. But he was angry, and he refused to go in. 
He was angry, and he refused to go in. This older brother, he's essentially saying, when he says this, would have been one of the, outside of his younger brother leaving and wishing his dad dead, the older brother's role in this family would have been to be the lead host. When something like this would have happened in this type of day and age, a family of this wealth and this status, they would have hosted the village. And the one who would have been the lead servant, and they, they did this because he was there to host the people, would have been the elder son. He would have shown up there and he would have greeted the guests. He said, welcome. Hey, thank you for coming to the banquet. All the other servants, they don't talk, they're there to serve, right? They're there to serve. They're hired, right? They're employed. But this is the future patriarch and he's there to show that even my guests, I will wait on them as an act of honor. The elder son is there and, and his role was to be that guest for all these people. He says, welcome, thank you for coming. Thank you for coming and I'm so excited that you're here. How can I serve you? And he begins to, to serve them out of the abundance of the family, out of the abundance of his inheritance. He begins to share with the villagers as they come in. Let me help you take your seat. And he begins to interact with the people that are there. And yet, what is his response? Look at the very next verse. It says that he refuses to go in. You see, outside of the younger brother wishing his father dead and then stripping apart the family, this older brother is essentially doing the exact same thing. He's refusing to play the role. He's refusing to be a guest. He's refusing to celebrate. He's refusing to have the heart of the father. He's essentially saying, I don't want to be a part of this family if this younger brother is going to be. I will not. And what's funny is we look at that and we say, why? why? What is it to him? You see, what's interesting is that the father in both of these stories, he runs out to both of his sons, embarrassing himself in front of the community both times. He runs to the younger son, but he runs out and he meets the older son there. Should the father not have gone out, this would have caused a separation and a rift between the two of them. Had he gone out and just placated to him and said, hey, that's okay, you know, just come on in, he would have completely denied and there would have been this, this animosity for years to come. But yet the father comes out and the only way to have any sort of reconciliation is he begs with him. He said, your son, don't, my son is back, don't you see? This is your brother who has been restored and redeemed. You see, the reason that the older son is so furious is the reason you and I find ourselves angry with God. One, this younger, this younger brother is trying to control the father by breaking all the rules. And the older brother is trying to control the father by keeping all the rules. Neither one of these sons cares for the heart of the father, but they care for the things of the father. Both of them, in both instances, want the things of the father. Give me your land. One of them chooses to go out and do it brazenly on his own, choosing to live wildly. But the other one, the one that Jesus is really trying to talk to, and I think that Jesus is trying to talk to many of us here today, is that we show up week after week to church, month after month, and we say, God, look how good I am. I've got a 150-day streak on you version. Come on, somebody. Man, Jesus, you owe it to me. And we find ourselves in this situation where we get out and life doesn't begin to go our way. God, why is this happening? Why am I suffering? Why are my expectations not being met? Do you, do you know what I've done? The older son is in the same boat. Why are you doing this? You and I, we, we act the same way. Like somehow God owes me. And what I do is I put God on trial and I'm the judge. You owe me because of what I've done. You owe me because of my goodness. I took a step of faith, God. Why, why aren't you doing this for me? And for many of us, we live in that sort of frustration just below the surface with an expectation that God owes us. You see, the younger son had the audacity to say it. He said, worth. 
he understood that he was no longer worthy. The problem is, is that the older son, he had the same mindset. And look at how he responds to the father too. We see this in his response. Verse number 29. He was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, look these many years, look what he says here. How many of us say this? I've served you. And I showed up and I stacked chairs. Where are all my guys at, right? Showing off them muscles. I'm stacking chairs in church. Come on, somebody. I'm putting away tables. I'm out here serving. You owe me. I never disobeyed your commands. Man, I got, I got one of those porn blockers on my phone. You owe me, God. Man, I don't have any of, those, any of those, uh, those, those apps. I got some restrictions on my phone. Come on, God, you owe me. You never gave to me what you gave to them. How come they're being blessed and I'm not? Why did they, why did they get the life that they want and I don't? You never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who devoured your property and you killed the fatted calf for him. God asks a question. To you and to me, he says, why are you so angry? Why are you so frustrated? Why is it just below the surface? Why can't you be honest with yourself and me about why you're so mad. You see, for many of us, what we do is we try and use our goodness to control God. This is the heart of the younger, or excuse me, this is the heart of the older brother. We try to control God. At this point, everything the father has been spending on the younger brother, it's actually come out of the inheritance for the older brother. Everything, think about it, everything at this point that is owned by the family, who inherits it? It's the older brother. So when the father kills the fatted calf and he throws the big party and he invites the whole town to partake, who is actually paying for it? It's the older brother. He's upset because it's, it's his. It's his land. It's his cattle. It's his money. It's his. Why are you doing this? This is mine. You see, he doesn't care for the father. He cares for the father's things. This is, this is mine. Why are you spending my money? And look what happens here in verse 31 and 32. This is the heart of God for you and for me, for many who have been in church for a long time. And he said to him, son, you are always with me. And all that is mine is yours. It's fitting that you celebrate and be glad for this. Your brother was dead and he is alive. He was lost and is found. What's shocking about this is that we don't know what happens. It's like, it's like the, a two act play and all of a sudden the story just ends. What happens to the older brother? What happens to the father? Does the celebration continue? We, we don't know. Jesus, as he begins to describe this to the Pharisees, all of a sudden he just cuts the story off. And we're left in this tension saying, what, what's gonna happen? What happens to this family? What happens to the true prodigal son? What happens to the older brother? Yeah, I think for many of us, we find ourselves in these points and these moments, and especially as you get older, you find that these just sort of build on themselves. Maybe you find yourself as a senior thinking that I did all this hard work and I thought that I was gonna get into the college that I wanted and I got denied and now I gotta reroute my plans. There's some of you out here today and you're saying, man, I know that I've got it so hard. I can't believe that I grew up in this type of family where there's violence and there's this abuse. There's this emotional abuse or physical abuse or maybe verbal abuse. And it's like, how come I can't be in a family like them? Where are you, God? You owe me. Some of you, you're out there and you're saying, God, I'm gonna save myself for marriage. I'm gonna be pure. And yet I can't get anybody to ask me out on a date. God, where are you? 
See, the thing that I realize is this, is that for many of us, the thing that keeps us from God is not our bad deeds. The thing that keeps us from God is our goodness. We build a wall around ourselves and we say, God, you owe me because of what I've done, because of my goodness. One day you and I, we will stand before the Father and you will say, why? Like, why should I let you into heaven? And you and I will have two opportunities, two choices. We can either stand there and say, it's only because of Jesus, I know him, and, and literally this covering, his righteousness covers me. It's like his resume I bring, and I say, because I know him, and this is the resume to get in where I wanna go, that's why I can come in, and the Father will say, welcome. But for others of us, we say, man, I'm doing the best that I can. I'm being really, really good. God's gonna have to owe me, and we'll stand before God on that day, and we'll say, God, here I am. They'll say, what have you done? You'll lay out your good deeds, and the problem is, it's that one bad deed that says, negates all of it. And we have this choice. We can either stand before God with one of these two things. You see, what I realized as I read the end of this story was that Jesus, he abruptly cuts it off for this reason. He cuts it off where there's this tension where we wonder what's gonna happen. Because anybody that knew, anybody that knew this story, he shared three stories, didn't he? He shared the story of the lost sheep. He shared the story of the lost coin. And he shared the story of the lost son. In those first two stories, what, what do we see happen? Someone goes after the lost sheep. Someone runs after the lost coin. Does anybody go after the lost son? You see, what I found was this, is that in that culture, you know the person that should have gone after him? It was the older brother. In that culture, the older brother, because he was the future patriarch, he took it upon himself. He said, I know, Father, he's messed up, but I will go and seek after him, and I will go and find him. And at my expense, I will pay to bring him back into the family in which he belongs. This younger son had a crummy older brother who chose himself over the son, who chose himself over the things of the father, who said, I don't care what you have to say, father. I care about my stuff and my things and my inheritance. Everything that the father gave belonged to the older brother and it came at his expense. But what I realized was this, that while this, this older brother wouldn't even go to the next village to find his, his brother, that you and I, we have a true older brother who didn't just go to the next village, who came from heaven to earth to come and seek and to save the lost. Who said, I won't allow you to stay in the pigsty of your life, but I will take upon myself my inheritance. And this is the crazy thing, is that our true older brother, he earned it all. He earned the robe, he earned the ring, he earned the authority. He earned it and yet he said, I will give it. I will split myself in two so that you might come back into the family, that you might find home for your soul, that you might find rest for yourself. You see, and instead of the robe, what did he get? What did he get? He got beaten and maligned and abused. Instead of the wine at the table, he got vinegar on the cross. Instead of the ring of authority, he got a crown of thorns for his head. For you and for me. You see, we have a true older brother. And he looks and he says, I did it for you. I did it for you. Who would bankrupt heaven so that he might have relationship with his sons and daughters. You know, this is, this is a little glimpse of heaven. You know that, right? As Jesus shares this story with these Pharisees, this is a glimpse of heaven. He says, one day when you and I, when we make our way to eternity, that one day there will be a true older brother there, and his name is Jesus. And he says that he will host us like a true older brother should. He'll say, welcome, son, welcome, daughter, come in to the table. 
come and sit and enjoy the feast. I earned it all for you. And I brought it here for you. And it's at my expense that you sit here because I long for you to find rest for your soul, to find home. With every head bowed, I'm gonna ask just a couple questions. And if this is you, I would just encourage you to pray with me. If you would say, Ben, Ben, I've, I've felt that. I, I felt like I've been the older brother. That I have somehow wanted to put God in my debt because of my good deeds, because of what I've done. I've used church as a leverage point and not as a point of relationship. See, that's me. I've tried to use my goodness to get into God's good graces. If that's you, if you would just pray this prayer with me, I, I ask that you would say this. Say, Jesus, please forgive me. Forgive me for my selfishness and my pride. I ask that you would take me back in. Let me see that the only worth is the worth of Jesus. Help me to trust in his sacrifice, to rest in his work. If you're here today and you say, Ben, I, I don't even have a relationship. I, I feel like I'm that younger brother and I've been running and I found myself at the end of the rope. I say, Ben, I, I want a relationship with God. Know this, friend, that there is nothing you can do to earn worth. It is only conferred by sonship or daughtership, and that is freely given. If that's you, say, Ben, I want that. I want you to pray this prayer. Say, Jesus, I need you. Come into my heart. Change my life. Make me new from the inside out. I want to follow you all the days of my life. Amen.